Well, as you can see, uh, I'm, I'm the guy you call Lester, Lester Brewer. And uh, you can see that I gave this presentation back in 2019 at our modelers retreat, which is uh, our local RPM where we draw about 100 plus two. And then I gave this presentation in St. Louis that year or Collinsville. And of course, now we're doing it tonight. To know what I've done with the presentation is take it uh, from when I originally gave it back then and update it for new things that I've picked up along the way since. Now, as you you know, uh, the basic tool we all have to have is a place to work. This happens to be mine. I have a desk uh, set up and I have the two lights as you can see. And along the way, uh, I finally currently, what's in there, I like the Duracell Ultra Bulbs and they give me the daylight, the 5,000K equivalent, which is what I have the railroad lit with. So for photography, everything works out the same. The work surface, as you can see on the desk, I have plate glass. I used to work in a machine shop in my college years. And of course, we had granite surface plates, but the closest thing to it is, is plate glass. And underneath, of course, you see that uh, there's, I have a gray sheet under there. I find the gray is much better than just having the glass on the desk because of small parts and things as you're assembling models, it's much easier to see them. Then of course, you, you gotta have some type of magnification. A lot of people like the Optivisor. I myself do not. As you can see, I have a magnifier glass uh, that you can buy at uh, various like art stores. Uh, a lot of the uh, catalogs like Micromart from the tool suppliers. And in there is a diopter uh, magnification is three. And then the lamp itself, as you can see, is a cool white, about 150 lumens. So this is what I find very adequate to uh, do the modeling by. Now the desk itself, other, uh, of course, since I'm using uh, the plate glass for the surface plate, I have to have the healing mats for cutting. And also I have, as you see, mark couple model holders. I do everything with just foam, nothing fancy. I cut it to the shapes I want. Have you noticed down in the lower left, uh, one year I picked up uh, for keeping the desk clean. I'm one of those. Uh, I used to work with my dad and I was the gopher. I got to uh, keep everything, the work site clean. So kind of gotten that habit. That vacuum cleaner uh, was one of those Christmas, in the Christmas aisle, you purchased at a Walgreens, picked up a couple and they re it's really, I think, for computers and it works real well for fine stuff on the desk. Now next to it, you see that ashtray and around my, uh, a lot of my modeling friends, I'll say, well, it's ridiculous that I keep everything and anything uh, from the standpoint in it. And that is even true with the scrap guys. I just, all the fine scrap, not the big stuff that goes in the trash, but all the fine I'll sweep into that. Uh, like it's, this is, happens to be a friend couldn't find a use for it. So he gave me one there, there it's an ashtray. But what they're good for is if you ever wanna make a scrap car lo scrap load from uh, a gun, let's say, or you want a small scrap pile by a structure, you dump that out, pour white glue on it, et cetera. You'll be amazed at the scrap pile you get. Now here, as I said, here are the workbench holders. There are a couple, one is just a flat piece of foam and the other is a U shape. So you can turn the, the model you're working on upside down. And other things it's nice to have, again, <clears throat> excuse me, based from my machine shop days, uh, they we used to have the holders for the plans and instruction sheets, et cetera. So it's kind of an old habit that has stayed with me in my modeling years. And I use them to hold the instructions and photos that I'm working on. Also, you notice I'm pointing out to you a bit box. I, am, I don't know if any of you keep them, but I do. Those are all the small little parts and whatever. Uh, yeah, sometimes, you, you know, even off of a sprue, you find something that might be usable. They go in the bits box. There's one for wire and one for small stream, et cetera. And you'd be amazed at how many parts I make out of those. Now tonight, and along with the tools, what we're going to do is we're going to actually look at this uh, stock car, uh, the NP, which was the, built uh, by the Mather 
car company. And we're going to take that model and the tools associated with building that and uh, several others here. Now, I, I first bought the first Mather uh, car. I bought one in 97. And the last one I built, and I built that car. And that retained its original number, the kit number. Then uh, ended up buying one here in 2016. Wanted to add another one. Now, over on, you see the kit at the top up there on in the upper. And of course, there you see my workbench and one of the drawers with some of the tools that we're going to be covering tonight. Now, obviously, if when we start on the, any kit, usually if let's we're doing plastic here, you're going to need a screw cutter. And you, know, you look over on the left side, you have up there the blue handled one. That's really my go to one. And I purchased mo many of my tools. If you went to Train Fest at all in Milwaukee, uh, I used to buy them, which the tool man, which was Billy Carr and his uh, spouse Rose. But uh, of course, Billy retired and uh, that is no longer around. But the orange handled one is a Xeron. <clears throat> and uh, so that, that's another one that's available. I have it. I just happen to use the other one all the time. Over on the right, you, the, the screw cutters on the left are great for the bulkier parts, but the real fine parts. It's nice to have those nippers on the, on the right there. The one in the front is the one that you find like at Micromart. Uh, usually you find Pakistan is where they're coming from. The finer ones are much more, they're gonna cost you a lot more if you choose to. Uh, I bought some of the PBLs, which is for the fine and very fine. They'll run you about 40 bucks a piece in that range for what it's worth. They all work very well. And by the way, uh, in my opinion, the cheapo, from let's say, which is not so cheap, uh, they're uh, $20 from Micromart. If you keep them sharpened, if you're sharpened uh, tools at all, uh, they work great and work as well as the others. Now our car, obviously, uh, when we started to take the underframe, one of the first steps, you have to put it in the bottom. And the first thing you find out is that it quite don't fit. It has splash on the bolster ends, cross ties. So sanding tool. My first go-to, and uh, when I began modeling and have stayed with them ever since, are the emery board or the sanding sanding sticks, which were easily available uh, in uh, the wife's uh, uh, utensils for her, uh, let's say, makeup or nails or whatever. So I used to start it with them and I've stayed with them. But there are many other sanding tools out there. Uh, the oldest ones, as you see here in the center, were the wood ones and you made your own cut your old sandpaper belts for them down in the lower left that you see the standing sanding sticks are there the fancier ones now are made by stevens international you can buy them again i refer a lot and i will tonight to micromart because uh they're one of the biggies out there besides model expo for having a, let's say our a good collection of tools then you got the the sanders you've probably seen at your local hobby shop uh, with the belts over on the right. Nowadays, we also have the sanding pads. Most of the, the they go up to 1200 grit. So you're into the polishing stages. Uh, you get a scratch on a model with that type of grit. You can take all that out. At mm -hmm. the top, the latest ones that I added to my collection just a few years ago are the sanding sticks. And you'll see one case tonight. They are extremely great for when you need to get into small places. Uh, if you, you know, for duplicate sanding, like if you were doing a resin kit, you have to want the sides of equal length. Up in the upper right hand corner, you have the Northwest short line, what's called their duplicate, duplicate cater or duplicate sander. So once you set the dimensions, uh, you can make the size, the, all the pieces exactly the same. Usually it's the sides in a resin kit. And that bottom one, that's, uh, I picked up uh, two sticks, uh, a motor at uh, my junk command. Uh, we call, we have a shop here called the Axe Man, and I built my own slow slow sander because I didn't like the prices of the ones on the market. And this one, uh, even it's just five inch, and it can sand resin or plastic with no burn or melting in it. Now I think I just Micromart claims they they've got a new one out there which I don't know much about yet or anything, but uh, that they claim it's, it's very slow speeds. But going back to our car, now 
we've used the nippers and we've cut out all the fine parts. And of course, you know, we're now got to install them in our car. So it's another tool you're going to need is you're going to need adhesives to do that. And I'm, uh, I use as on the left side, uh, I started of course with testers. You can see that's what the models are. And along the way came 10X and I, I uh, played with that, bought that, used it, good product, excellent. Uh, however, once I read the, the L, Allen Armitage, I started, I started modeling in the days when mo many of the kits uh, were all wood rather than serene. And as a result, uh, along came Armitage with, and wrote a thesis on serene fabrication and Chemtron pu published it at the time. And he uh, talked about the ketones and the MEK. And I, I said, well, of course, why would I buy the stuff at the hobby shop when I can go down the hardware store? So here in Minnesota, I can believe in Michigan and other, most of the states, California is one who's banned them, but you can buy MEK in the court. And uh, it's an excellent, it's a solvent. And it, uh, as you uh, probably are already all aware, will really weld the plastic. It's not gluing it, so to speak. It's actually welding it in the process. On the right, we all have our CAs. My, you gave your favorite. Mine happens to be the Zap, which I can purchase at the local hobby shop. And also, as the I keep it in that plastic container. In Minnesota here, the humidity can get uh, pretty high, and I try to control. I control it, of course, in the train room and area, but still, I keep it. The glue itself. In, in the container with, you know, the dryers that come in various products. So there's some dryers in that plastic bottle. It used to be if I didn't get and kept it out in the open, I would end up usually with a half a bottle gone all the time in the container with the dry, the, keep it this way, I can use the whole bottle. Yet, most CAs age in time. And all, one of my other favorites, of course, is the Loctite, uh, Loctite and Rather than the weld one in the back, there should be the gel container of Loctite that I buy at any, you can buy them at the hardware store, uh, home improvement stores. And also I find is the Zap, which is very low viscosity. The uh, uh, Loctite is a little higher, let's say a little denser viscosity, but as that Zap ages, so I pretty much all the time nowadays mix Zap, five drops and a couple drops of uh, the Loctite. Also, the new one that really hasn't been around a lot of years, but it is it's out there, is the Formula 560. And I use that. It's really like a white glue, but it's excellent for, it has a lot of uses. Then, of course, you got your uh, contact cements. You're all familiar, I'm sure, with the goo. And it's uh, that's a very thick viscosity. You can thin that down to, let's say, the barred cement. I don't know if you're all familiar with that, but the barred cement is another uh, contact cement, but of much greater viscosity than the goo. And that, if you're interested, if you have never used it or want to give it a try, it would be used like attaching on a resin kit. You might attach a, ru a running board to uh, the, uh, the, 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 the supports for the running board. So, uh, I buy mine for what it's worth. It was used in the shoe industries where it comes from. And I actually, I buy it, our local, most of the shoe repair local shops, they do carry it. Now, other, otherwise you see they're also the testers. And as you're again aware, that's just a solvent in a high viscosity. And a lot of people say, well, gosh, it's really stringy and stuff, but I still use it. And I use it a lot. If you, if you put a dab on, let's say, whatever surface you want or you're putting your glue uh, and use it, it will not be very stringy. And I call it my stick to power. You know, when you need a part to stick, because if you're going to do it with a liquid solvent to attach a part, you tr sometimes you need three or four hands to hold the model, the part, and try to apply the glue. On the right, you see, obviously, the which has been around forever, the five-minute epoxies. And uh, don't use it very often, but once in a great while. Uh, primarily today, I like if I'm going to use the five minute epox, the JB Weld, because you can also use the JB Weld for uh, creating small parts in a rubber mold. And for those of you that have seen some of my pre presentations before on models, 
you know that I like the Permatex for attaching uh, weights in the cars. Now, again, here we have our car. Well, we've got the part, the underframe in there. So we had it. You have to have an applicator. We got the glue, or the MEK in my case, the liquid. So you need. Now the testers was nice because they had their a brush applicator built right into the bottle. However, those of you who use testers and let it sit around for a long time, maybe uh, found out what I did that the brush eventually melted and so did the applicator right in the, uh, the testers. But anyway, so I just use small brushes today. This happens to be a makeup brush from the department. But as for glue app applicators, uh, you can buy commercial ones, okay? There are some loop ones out there, et cetera. I don't like them. And here, I make my own simply, uh, it's a wood handle. And as you can see on the right, it's a needle. And the needle is cut in half uh, with a Dremel tool and a disc in it uh, and allows that small V. The reason I want the V is when you apply glue to small parts, like let's say we're going to work doing uh, gluing on the grab irons, that V will carry your uh, sol your solvent or, you know, the, <clears throat> the liquid glue, excuse me, or the MEK in my case, right up and you can that V and, and it will then sink right around the part. Anyway, you need, you should have something, obviously, that all of us have different, you, what you want, want to put your glue in or where you want to put it. I use, uh, drink a lot of bottled water here in this house. So, don't throw away the bottle caps. I, those are my go-to and you see it on the left side in a foam. And it's simply, that's where I put the glue and uh, the cap next to it is one of the, just for holding toothpicks and whatever. Now I get it still, I said the CA, as we all know, is supposed to set up in seconds. We know that's all not true. Sometimes it takes to account at 20, 25. I can get impatient at times. So on the right side, you see zip kicker, I buy it in a bottle. Uh, do not buy the spray, waste the money. If you're gonna, and, and put it in some other bottle that's convenient. The spray is not very, the spray one does no good for models. All you do is get zip kicker all over the model where you wanna apply it no different than you do CA with an applicator. You know, like the ones I, I said I make myself. So I have one for the CA and one for the zip kicker. Also, as we all know, whichever applicator you use for CA, it, it's going to sooner or later, it's going to start to clog up from the residue that stays and doesn't get to the model. So I have cardboard uh, uh, pads sitting, as you see on a piece of foam. I have those mounted uh, with uh, uh, like a mount onto the uh, glass in the corner, my surface plate. And that's where I will touch the applicator to keep it from uh, building up the CA. And it, the reason you see I get mine are two inch by inch and a half, that started because uh, as I retired, I kind of uh, ended up for in my early years, business cards, the company supplied them. Well, I started cutting them in half for glue pads. And uh, so I've, that's kind of the size they ended up. So I've stayed with them. Anyway, no matter what you're going to use for your your glue, in my case, the MEK or the liquids, the testers, be it, uh, you should have some type of ventilation. And I, so there's another tool that's nice. It's on the workbench to have. Plus, if you have a warmer place and uh, the air conditioning doesn't work, you can still keep modeling. Uh, and if sometimes it, uh, the frustrations of modeling can be overcome if we have a little music maybe alongside in the background. Now, back to our, uh, so those are, now we've got that uh, underframe attached. Usually the next step in a model uh, for most is to attach the couplers and the trucks. In my case, I like to uh, drill and tap 256 uh, and uh, for the uh, trucks and couplers. And you see that uh, that I used to be, I like to have different sizes of pin vice available. And uh, a lot, eventually up on top, when you're tapping a lot of times, or especially sometimes in the metal, metal, even resin can do it. That tap wants to really, doesn't want to go in easily. So I use an old product that I picked up. Uh, actually, my, I have bought up to buy it at the local hobby shop. 
And as you can see, it's pro-cut. Basically, all it is is beeswax. If you go on the hardware store and buy a chunk of beeswax, it accomplishes the same task. Now, as I said, I had a changeover. In my case, along came, I was in the accounting profession, years of using vending machines, et cetera, computers. Uh, lo and behold, carpal tunnel came along. And so my doctor said, if you want to continue using your hands, you better change from the pin vice. So I went to the Dremels and you see them left. I have the eight fifties and there you see another Dremel, uh, now a fancy drill, a drill, if you need a vertical drill press stand, mine is simply the Dremel stand with a Dremel mounted in it, which so nice to have once in a while. The drill bits themselves, you will hear many, many arguments over drill bits. Uh, I started with the uh, ones on the left, the far left uh, photo, you see that it was like, there have been various manufacturers have put those up, names, you found them under, I believe I bought it under Exacto, uh, or there was a Mason, I believe, had it. And it's been under various names. Another one is in the orange case. Uh, now the drill bits themselves, um, as I say, people say, okay, there's fancy German ones. They much sharper, et cetera. In my opinion, I disagree. I've, uh, I've bought the German ones. There's bits like you can buy from MasterCar, uh, Drill Bit City, et cetera. Uh, being in the accounting profession, again, I cost a lot of items, even in the hobby, I can't let go of that. And I find that, uh, I find the Walters bit, which I buy in the local hobby shop, uh, at the price it is even for two, uh, is quite sharp. It does a nice job of drilling. Uh, so by the time if I order from one of the other companies, pay the postage, et cetera, I'm money ahead purchase, getting it at the local, so I, at the local hobby shop. So I stay with the Walters uh, drill bits. Now, sometimes those drill bits that you see on the left are a little short. So you, you, now we go look over at the right side. And in a discussion years ago, and I mean many years ago, because Jim Hedinger has passed model rotor for a long time. Uh, when we got into a discussion regarding adding train lines to freight cars, he suggested these uh, uh, the longer bits there on the far right that you see from King Tool. And if to this group, I have actually sent those drill, a photo of those drills out before. And when I check the internet, uh, King Tool is still in business, still sells those. So, however, they're still, even though Jim was kind enough to say, less these are the ones they think you ought to get, they still were not long enough really to do a train line. So uh, all of it, I, of course, I did a lot of woodworking in my day too. And in the woodworking hobby, or in when you worked, you needed a lot of times a long drill bit, a small one. Uh, there, we made them out of piano wire. And all you do is sharpen the tip uh, out of, uh, I happen to like a 32 gauge piano wire, and I make mine about four inches long. If you don't want to make your own, obviously, McMaster Carr does have some really nice long six inch drill bits. And those are the ones on the bottom there under the package containing the ones I have made. And up on top, once you have the drill bits you want, most people like to mark the a hole where they're gonna apply the drill. Cause I, even on plastic or on resin, the drill bit has a tendency to slide, especially the small ones. So yeah, there are all kinds of uh, alls out there. Uh, the, I happen to use mostly the top one, which is simply a push pin for uh, the bulletin board type uh, use. And if you haven't got anything else, the quickest thing is take one of your pin vices and throw a needle in it when you need one. Then of course, taps, you have to, as another tool we're gonna need, if you're gonna end up tapping uh, for the screws for your, uh, let's say couplers and trucks. This is again, for the one that's in that photo on the left, it's just a tap mounted in an exacto handle. I bought those at the hobby shop years ago. I have broken several 256s over the years. Uh, I've currently purchased the last one, the 256 taps from Fastenal. So that's another company, good tool company, purchase various tools from. On the right, uh, obviously, now we're going to need something to insert those screws, and you're going to need a screwdriver. And I just pictured this one because Digitrax was 
at various shows, including Train Fest, was giving them away for free. And uh, they're pretty nice. They actually are, are very nice uh, screwdriver, flathead on one end, uh, the, on the other end. So you have both types of screws. And then I was using Atherns and uh, they became pricier. So now I use the Fastenal. But other there's many screwdrivers on the market. And my go-to is sitting in on the left side. I have that stuck in my tool drawer. And one, obviously, uh, the flathead and the other. And then you have the ones on the left. And like I say, there's just so many screwdrivers out there. It's the, the now my pride and joy in that photo is the second one from the bottom because it happens to be the one with the wood handle. That came out of my first tool kit my dad gave me when I was uh, very young in, at that time. And uh, those are many years ago. But okay, now to also, once we have the couplers and the truck pins, ready for mounting the screws. When I was young, and I'm sure many of you, though, or many of you may still have your finger dexterity, it's easy to pick that screw up and turn it in almost by hand. However, uh, at my age, no, no longer really possible. So now it's the screw holders. And you see the two types that are the most common on the right. The upper one is the one that the four little wires come out. I personally don't care for it. I, I bought it. A lot of times on many screws, even the smaller, like like let's say the Ather, you have the Fastenal, it will spin on the head rather than turn the screw into uh, where it is to go. So the lower one, if you notice, has like two small clamps that come out. It has a V-cut in them. And those that V-cut holds that screw very well and uh, turns it into where you want it to go. Once you have couplers mounted, now we have our trucks on. Uh, you have also the, well, the couplers I'm saying, you want that even MRH, Model Railroad Hobbyist, said it's nice to give it a slight bend, even upward. And for that, you need a player and that's the trip player. Katie sells them. You've heard me say this before. It's an orthodontist tool. Tool man and used to sell them much, much cheaper in KD. And that's what this one is there. A lot of those again come out of Pakistan. Now on the far right, when you start putting wheel sets and changing out wheel sets, which I do, which I did on this car, on the stock car, uh, a lot of the older trucks and the Atherns, the uh, model die casting, even the, let's say train miniature, uh, even the PK2, you have the trucks, uh, the journals on the trucks are not really turned out as well as they could be. So along the way in the hobby, Exacto, on, if you, on, we look on the right, Exacto came out with the, what they called their truck turner. And they originally, I was told it was developed, they had it developed in Colorado. And that's what I would use for quite a few years when I bought it from them. Mine was getting dull a little from uh, doing truck after truck. So I went back to them and I found that they no longer held the quantity, the standard. They were shorter, so it was not the same uh, piece of equipment they originally came with. I wrote them letters, et cetera, and they, well, they, uh, yeah, we, never, we did settle and they returned my money. And so eventually I went to try the Micromart, which uh, is the same exact copy of that tool. And that one maintains the old standards that Exacto originally had. So I can say I use the Micromart today. It is fine, does uh, the same job. The original exacto did then of course you need uh, another tool you got to have if you're going to work on the cars is is you should have a coupler gauge uh the kds are out there they're in metal or plastic and obviously sometimes uh when you check that coupler height after you got them on uh you need uh they aren't the proper height they may be a little low uh in that case you need the washers that are up on top you had a washer uh, they, which you can get, and Katie has fiber washers in 10 and 15 thousands. You can buy, uh, if you buy tissue products, they have them in 20 thousands plastic. So there, there's quite a few, there's many available. Anyway, other gauges are out there. On the left side, you see a, a metal gauge, a uh, coupler gauge that's come out. That was uh, in the Micromart catalogs. Uh, I'm kind of a tool junkie and test a lot of them. Uh, 
so but that one it's nice if you want it i i can't say it does it excites me and you have the nmra gauge which does it but compare either of those compared to a kd gauge uh i i don't think it's worthwhile using when you get the kd okay we got the frame under mount and all of a sudden hey we got a brake pipe missing that uh was on the on the parts we put on on the piping and whether I broke it off or somehow caught it, well, anyway, it wasn't there. So that you got another set of tool you can have in the toolbox is we'll replace it not with plastic. We're going to replace it with wire, and so you need you can add wire bending pliers. In this case, uh, the lower left is a shopsmith. I originally started with those, uh, which are available at Hobby Lobby. I prefer now the Zeron on the right, as you see, they have much finer points than the. And you can, I can bend uh, a small eye bolt if I have to with those. Now, also, you, to, you know, yes, when we buy the wire, it nicely comes in a package. It's marked for us. Some of us are probably very neat and orderly. We keep it in those. Others do not. Or remember my bit box, once a wire gets so short, I end up throwing it in there. Where there, I don't keep track of them. So I got to, if I want to use one, what size is it? Well. From my days of working in the machine shop, I still have my micrometer over on the left. So I use that a lot still today. Of course, you got your calipers, as you can see. Uh, yeah, I started with the dials. I still like the old dial. Of course, now we got the uh, digital, which is the top on the right. And that little guy is, uh, was a four inch that I used in a, uh, when I was doing a lot of woodworking. Uh, it would turned out one of the woodworking catalogs that is on my bench and I use it almost all the time. It, uh, and I use it strictly for carrying measurements and I'll show you that in a minute. But, and here's what I mean by carrying measurements. When you take a caliper, the left side, you have the, that one was a caliper made by PFM that was done in HO scale. And, but all I'm, I use many of the calipers and a little four inch don't need uh, any type of measurement because you just spread this caliper from point A to point B, which let's say we've done like a, do a grab iron, or if you're doing a structure, let's say you're cutting a door, the back of a, a door, you take that measurement from the opening just by opening the caliper from one side to the other, carry that measurement like here's being done, the screen, mark it and cut it. And it saves this time of putzing with the measuring tools such as the ruler, uh, scale rule up at the top, much faster, much quicker, and many times actually you get a very accurate uh, part. Then on the lower, I just threw that in. Uh, for those, you know, I said PFM on the left made a caliper that was in HO scale. General also did one in plastic that came out as you can see there. They had a dial and that literally reads one, two inches. I use that on and off when I work with plans or I want uh, a, a quick, a good measurement. General did a very nice job with it being in plastic. It still is very accurate and does a very nice job. Now, so here we've taken our wire bending tool that we talked about. We bent the wire, we've installed it. So now we're not quite ready to do it because we have a bare wire that we got to paint. And all of us have, again, you're going to have your favorite paints. Uh, I started with the, uh, the flocal solvents, uh, scale coats, eventually went to polyscale, which I liked, and the water, because of water base, faster drying times, went from seven days to I can dry it in actually half quickly with the hair dryer. But uh, so when polyscale left us, I uh, went to the Vallejo, made, made by a company out of Spain, but they're, I, I think they're highly great product. Uh, very, they come in two types, the model color, which is brushable, and they have a one called model air, which is uh, airbrush supposedly ready. Uh, it, it may be airbrush ready, but like any other paint, when it sits on the shelf for a while, it has a tendency to settle out. You're going to have to mix it. So I, whether, whichever one I, I am using, whether it be the color or the air, uh, Obviously, I will. I always, uh, depending on if I'm airbrushing, I have to uh, maybe mix. Uh, you have to thin them. But if you don't for brushing, I use uh, again. There's the bottle caps and another foam holder. 
and I will put my drops of paint, which is normally all we need is a few drops. And that's what I, where the, I think the Vallejo containers shine is that they have that eyedropper feature right on the bottle. So you drop a few in, for me into a plastic bottle cap, uh, paint the part and you're ready to go. Now on the right, uh, there a lot of times after we clean uh, the brush and water, which uh, you saw in the life, I use a pill bottle that I keep on the bench and uh, I just keep the tap water in there for cleaning a brush for like this quick event. So I don't have to get up from the desk and go get water. But uh, on the right side, you see I have it, there's Armor All Auto Glass Cleaner. Originally, some years back, model railroad hobbyist Joe Fugate uh, wrote this up as an article and that it was a very nice brush cleaner and air brush conditioner after you get done with a brush usage. And I thought, well, could that really be true? And I, well, hey, what? What's it's a? I can use it on the car if nothing else. But it turns out it really did work very well. And I found that even after you take a brush, clean it up in water, if you took it and put it in the Armorol Auto Glass Cleaner, you found that even additional material came out of the uh, came off the brush a lot of times. Uh, the only thing is, is that now, again, just uh, in the last some months earlier in the year. Joe Fugate has come out and said that the Armorall uh, auto glass cleaner formula has changed. So it, he no longer, it can no longer be recommended. So the old one was good. Again, the new one uh, due to formula change is not the best. So anyway, now we have our underbody on our NP uh, stock car. Uh, we're, we're moving it, we can move on. If we were doing a resin kit, uh, if we go back, and you look carefully at that underbody, that already our train line was molded on. Now in most of your resin kits, which is on the left side, uh, your train line, if you're gonna do one, is not molded on. So you're gonna have to put one in. And if you remember when I mentioned we drills, having them as tools, uh, there they are, uh, you know, the ones I use on the right, but you can go in now from the end of the car, drill through the, the bolster, the be it the cross ties or whatever and wherever you want that train line to be and drill it with I end up mounting mine by the way in the Dremel tool as I said and drill and then stretch it through and for the train line if you see on the left side it's green in color and the reason is uh, the train line can be if it's a one and a quarter inch it's about uh, that should be about 15,000 square if it's going to be one and a half inch, it would be on about 19 thousandths. Uh, I use a, a floral wire. I used to use uh, Detail Associates brass, uh, which they made a 19 thousandths wire, but they're, count, they're pricey now, I think, and they're hard to find. The hobby shop has a hard time getting them. So I switched over to floral wire, which you can find uh, at any hobby lobby is uh, one Michaels, et cetera. Now, the other tool that I think is great to keep on the desk, and you see the desk photo in the, again in the upper uh, left, is what I call the, their aids, you know, that we all want, that you all of a sudden need a reference. You say, uh, now, if your memory is sharp as it always was, and mine isn't quite, so I have to, uh, I rely on my aids. And you've heard me talk about, uh, so I keep a box. It's simply a, a model box that one of them and I keep various things in there, notes like on the three by five card in the front, uh, serene dimensions, or if in my, one of my favorite that I have a tendency to preach about is the Cal scale sheets, which are great. You have the diagram there for uh, piping, uh, other parts that uh, you can put on, you know, that are attached to a model. And also I have my dimensions that I, I use as a standard marked out there etc. So it's nice to keep something like that. I have another box on if you up at the desk photo, if you look to the left, you can't really see it. I have all my what I call my painting drift cards in there too. But now we go back to our model, we've got the underside done. And you notice that over on the, if we look at the prototype photo, which I do not know if many of you work from I do, because I'm trying to match the prototype and 
whether it be plastic or resin, as close to the prototype as possible. You notice that the prototype NP next to the reporting marks and number does has no board or no fill between the uh, the side boards. And notice on the model, our Proto 2000 model has those boards filled in. So if we're going to match the prototype, we need to remove those from between. If they they might not bother you, it's fine if you choose to leave them. Uh, like I say, if we're trying to match the prototype, we have to remove them. So in order to do that, we're going to use some of the tools there on the left, and we're going to cover each of those in, uh, in individually. But then you also have the tools on the right that you need, should have around that uh, you hope you never have to use. I keep a bottle of iodine. Uh, uh, in my day, you you know, the exacto tools are nice and round. I actually have had one roll off the bench in my day and end up with the blade in my thigh. So, and once in a while, I'm sure we all slip and get a finger cut. And the iodine is nice to have there. I use iodine, whatever. And uh, if you use the super glows and you have a tendency sometimes to touch your fingers together, you might bond them up. And that's where the debonder comes in. If you don't want to buy the debonder, as long as the better half is using nail polish remover, that has the same materials in it and uh, is a quick way to get your fingers back apart. But now, and I, if you looked, we're looking at what the tools were for what you say, a block of wood. Why do it, would I want a block of wood? Well, on the plastic model, the stock cars, or whether it be plastic or resin, uh, obviously to try to cut those boards out that we're going to take out next to the reporting marks, that side is really flimsy. You put a knife to it or you put a razor blade to it, uh, it's gonna bend and most likely you're gonna break uh, those parts. So yeah, uh, if you have, take in the show, which, you know, I, I said, I used to do a little more working. I still have my table saw, et cetera. Uh, I will cut a chunk of wood at, to the dimensions of inside the car and set it in there for this type of work when you have to, let's say, remove those boards. Oh, okay, now as for you, as for cutting, you could use uh, you could use a razor, single edge razor blade. Uh, this plastic I thought was pretty tough for that, but I always keep uh, my have three of them all the time stuck under my plate glass on the edge, uh, and they're marked as such. The one with the single dot, that's the newest blade, sharpest blade just came out. The number two, I keep them, and the three, that you know, they just move on down the line. When I pull a new one, one becomes two, two becomes three, three goes in the trash. And they, I use two and three a lot for scrapers. If you notice up on top, uh, there I'm using it as a scraper to uh, then a running board. The old running boards obviously were quite thick. You can't scrape them or mill them down to proper thickness of today's uh, use, so it's about a prototype <laughs> about two, two and a half inches. Now, some people or uh, modelers are queasy about holding it to a uh, single edge razor blade or serb. So you have box cutters out there on the right, which you can insert those into, obviously. Then you have the all different types of knives, right? And obviously we all either, if you go to the left side, up on top, uh, second one down is your exacto handle. This one happens to, but the first one up on top, if you know, remember I said that the second type handle from the top had a tendency to roll on the desk. Well, some of the manufacturers like Excel came out with the, where they don't roll. And so you see that one with a number 11 blade. Then eventually I went to scalp, got the scalpel blades because I did the number 11 exacto has a tendency to break that tip off all the time. And as a result, I went to the surgical scalpel blade, which does not do that. I started by mounting them in the exacto handle, which is the second one from the top there. And eventually I, oh, I purchased, uh, now you go to the third one down. That's the fancy doctor's scalpel handle. And in my hand, it's uncomfortable. I don't care for it. And the bottom one, I, However, I did find uh, I was at the doctor's office and needed a removable, and he used a, one of these uh, surgi a surgical uh, throwaway uh, with scalpel blade in it, the knife, 
I asked him about it and he said, well, uh, I, I, he, was, he said, I can't give it to you. That's, can't do that. But so I went home and did some research and uh, some Cincinnati surgical will sell them to you. Not all surgical houses will, uh, especially after COVID I found if you were not uh, in the medical profession, they wouldn't sell them to you. But uh, Cincinnati surgical did. You have to buy them by the box of 50, but for me, they're worthwhile. So that's what I use constantly. And I've even learned that even on, even though they're supposed to be throwaways, you can change the blades in those too. You notice on the right, the typical for number five, exacto handle, 18 blade. Then you got your number two with the 17. And another manufacturer like Excel over there on the left side came out with a handle so it does not roll off the desk. As, as I said, you know, where possible, you've heard of it, people having accidents. Then you've got the other type. You've heard me cover these before uh, in this group. That's, you know, uh, the number five handle exacto. On the left, you see the blade. It's a 17 cut ground to what I want for a blade. Now, the other two are the mini scalpels available from Micromart with, uh, and notice if you really look closely at those scalpel blades, it's kind of like having an 18 in miniature and a 17 in miniature. And you've heard me mention sharpening. And in the past, I've talked about, well, the photo is up there on the top, the fishing stone uh, type from the local hardware store or local tackle shop, a good fishing stone where you, you can sharpen those continually. And a piece of small leather, this one happened to come off when I bought a, a leather belt that had this attached, perfect little, perfect little piece of leather for stropping that blade after you sharpen it. And when I'm talking sharpening, you need to make five to 10 passes, a few on the strop and you're ready to go. And you'll have a very sharp blade every time you're working. Now, the reason I have it is that this type of blade, we're starting to also take off grab irons, which uh, I have to, or I did, I did not take a photo of the stock car we're working on. So here's a, I put in a photo of a, uh, the Fowler box car that was made by Acurel, which used these knives to remove the grab irons and in this case, the ladder runs. Then we use files and what, you know, once you get the opening cut with one of the knives there, you know, you're gonna have the edges very hard to cut out with a knife. And so you may, and even the edges may not be perfectly smooth, a little rough. So the file is one instrument you possibly can get depending on the size. And my favorite, oh, I started with the files on the left, that plastic box containing just nail files, et cetera. But of course they are not the best. So you want a, a collection of files in your toolbox. And my favorite is the little diamond files with the red handles. And they go in the tiniest places. Uh, then there's a little bit larger file in the, the container on the left of the case. And they, you know, again, larger on the right, et cetera, and down below a little bit larger. So for various, depending on what you need the file, there are various sizes for various cases. Also a tool you may or may not be familiar with, uh, especially like this when we're cutting out those boards on that stock car is a brooch. On the ends where when you, you can obviously make the long cut on the long end of the board, but on the end, that is so tiny, very hard to do with a blade. So a brooch, if you notice, is really a saw in its own way or a cutting tool. And you notice on the right, it's really like a needle with fine teeth. It only cuts on the back when you draw it back. It does not uh, cut for on the forward push. It only cuts on the back. But something like this, when we're removing those boards on the ends of each four with the removal piece, if there's still roughness and stuff, this is a great tool to clean something like that up. Also, uh, if you're working on like a, a center sill that we're on a freight car on a plastic or resin again, a fish belly type sill where you have to have uh, your brake levers may go into a hole in that sill. This type of tool, if you use a drill to start the, and then is a great tool for making that elongate that uh, hole. Obviously, you also have dental picks. Uh, I have a large collection. Uh, when I used to go to Train Fest, I used to go every year 
uh, up until COVID. And then uh, at, at most uh, first place everybody went was Lombard Hobbies to grab their locomotives and cars. But my next stop always was the tool man. And sometimes <laughs> I went there first. And that was again, Billy Carr, because he had a great collection of, and I purchased most of these from him. Uh, as you see, there's a great deal of different types of scrapers <coughs> there. Some are available. There's a few in there, like the bottom, the one to, on the right there, the bottom one, I actually got from my dentist, believe it or not. So uh, it depends on, and I still actually, my, my, I have to have a crown put in. And when he was doing some work, he had a dental tool you used, a couple of them, I said, hey, uh, you know, uh, this crown is costing a few bucks. You got any uh, broken ones that you don't, and he looked at me and said, really, you what, you want some? And I said, well, be nice. So I actually ended up with a few more in my collection. But anyway, you see the various ones at the top and the bottom type or the putty type. So there's lots of those out there that you can use. So now, if you notice the prototype photo again, we look back at our model. Uh, we've now, the boards we need to remove are removed. However, if you remember at the start of the presentation, I said, uh, yeah, that uh, I have purchased now a second car. The model comes with 168 are the last three digits. That prototype here at 163. Now on the first model I built, I left 168. However, in this one, I decided, well, can't have a two 168, so got to change the number. If you're going to change the number, more tools. Uh, the, the scratch. A scratch brush is my favorite tool for removing lettering, uh, existing lettering on cars. The for, I first encountered it in a shop. We used to have a tool shop where I used to go for look various tools, whether it be model tools or uh, woodworking. Uh, we had a place called Beaumont's and that gentleman is now, the shop is closed, he's passed on. But he introduced me to the Euro tool line and the uh, first scratch brush, the nylon one. Now you can see in the center photo down on there, they come in nylon, they come in brass, and they come in stainless steel. The brass ones are excellent for when you're working on track, you're making soldering leads or stuff, you wanna clean, if you, they're uh, excellent type brass brush for cleaning the track. Along the way, a gentleman uh, uh, I've got to know on the RPM world, George Stoneman uh, lives in Illinois area, Chicago area. Uh, he one day said, hey, you like the scratch brushes. Are you using that little guy? That's the one in the upper right. And it happened to be at the time of the Micromart catalog. And I told him, no, I would not seen it. So I looked it up, ordered one. And that's now actually become my go-to. Uh, because of that very fine tip, I find that I will put Walter Salvaset on a, something I want to remove, the, let's say the lettering. And if you take your time with the, now not the brass or the obviously stainless steel, but the nylon and that very fine tip, you make some passes very light and you will remove the lettering. Then of course, uh, another thing you have to have around in the toolbox, car weights, you know, most of these models, whether it's plastic or the, again, the resin ones, most of them, Today, they don't have the weights at all. They used to come with them. So you're gonna to have to have a weight supply. Uh, obviously, uh, you can have the, the sheet metal type, which is, you know, I have it in 20 and 40 thousandths. Very lucky to have a friend. His daughter works in uh, a lab where they still use metal for certain tests. And so she was able to order us rolls. Then of course, on the lower you have, you can use nuts, whatever, uh, tire weights are a big one. Uh, I, I use tire weights today. And I had a couple of friends who are electricians and they, uh, they saved me. Those are the electrical punch outs, the circles you see down there. You could buy washers the same size in a hardware store. So there are many different types. As you, I've said, when we were looking at the uh, adhesives to, uh, to put the model together, for when it comes to attaching a weight to plastic, I recommend don't use the goos or the, the contact cements. You can use the CA, but uh, I've been at this in, since the 70s, and I've guys probably built around seven, eight hundred cars, 
And I can tell you on an operating railroad, the ones that were just attached with CA in the earlier years, some of those weights come loose. And if that model is completely glued together, uh, it's very difficult. You may be able to take it apart, but uh, odds are you won't want to. And now you're gonna have a car with a weight bouncing around. So I find the silicone in all the years I've used it. Uh, and by the way, that is available if you're gonna buy it. Uh, it's uh, available, I buy mine at Walmart and it's in the automotive section because it was primarily used in the automotive industry to uh, create gaskets for gasket creation. I use a product called E6000. Uh, it's a clear, uh, a clear cement that uh, dries pliable and I've never seen it let go. Okay, fantastic. That's another one then, guys, that uh, Brian is saying we can use. I then put that in the, goo, I put that I in the chat. Okay. Then they have the goo, and I still use the goo, obviously, or the playa bonds or whichever. Uh, if you got it, like for the metal weights, metal, metal, perfectly fine. Um, then a lot of times, even after I apply uh, silicone, I a lot of times do put uh, CA gel, which is the type at the top. That there happens to be the gel, the sap. I don't use that anymore. I use, uh, like I said, uh, nowadays, just uh, the one I, we started with. Then you notice the resin body down there. Also in the resin bodies, which you don't need on the plastic models most of the time, but resin models I have found, especially the later year ones, are have a tendency to bow inward. So. If you are going to do that, I urge you, when you put your weights in the model, just as a sideboard tip here, please insert a baffle and you'll have then no problem in the future with that uh, side bowing inward. Okay, obviously our car also was not weighted correctly. And you know, uh, yeah, so I, you throw them on a postal scale, uh, the average on a 40 foot model box car is uh, 3.8 ounces for the regular NMRA formula. Uh, if they go up to four, I don't care. But again, if we go back to our stock car, you notice in the upper right, I've thrown, we got openings on the end of that car. Now on the prototype, on the NP cars, that those openings did not exist on the car. So if you notice on the left, the Proto 2000 manufactured the kit, they were kind enough to put the piece in there to, uh, so if you wanted to match the prototype, close the end up, they had the piece in there, but you gotta glue it in. Obviously I used, um, it's a good way to show you clamps. I, there's a, just a couple of hairpin uh, that the ladies use for their hair that you pick up at the local I do at the Walgreens. Other, there's the clamp drawer I have. And there, you know, you got the brass clamps on the far right, uh, the, you know, just various all different types over the years I've collected. The uh, very uh, one clamp in there is uh, if the, the yellow small clamps, which were purchased at the home improvement store, uh, but there's a clamp right on that corner to the top right of those yellow ones. If you, that's the Kaufman clamp. And if you're doing resin car kits, uh, that is one nice clamp to have in your toolbox. Uh, because it allows you to clamp the side and end of a car in there together and do a, a nice sharp right angle, which you need when you're assembling resin kits. That being if it's a flat kit, not a one piece body kit. Okay, in our case now, uh, we also had to uh, attach the running board. And I was in on my pin vices, I became a real fan of the Starrett's. I found they were one that held the, uh, they were, you know, a true zero turn down co uh, collet in them. They uh, would hold, when I, you put a drill in them, you chucked it in there, they held that drill very well. Um, I have read in recent, this year, I guess, some people complaining that maybe Starrett's quality is lacking. I don't know. Uh, going by their reputation, and tools I've owned, theirs, theirs over the year, they're one of the finest quality tools. And I, their pin vices, all of them that I have, work very, very well. But anyway, what we had here, the problem was on the kit when attaching the running board. 
the pins that the holes were too small for the pins. So one way you could do it, you could use a drill and enlarge those holes. Uh, another way we'll look at is there's a better way of doing it in a little bit. But also on the right, on the upper uh, right, there you have a resin kit where you're attaching. Uh, uh, in this case, that's probably a metal running board. And you're, in those, there are not going to be holes there. If you want to use holes, you are going to have to do drill them. I myself do not. I just uh, attach them to the roof saddles that are already molded on the model. And with the proper glue, uh, I happen to use the Formula 560 today. You could, if it's a plastic on plastic, like our stock car, and you want that running board glued on, which we did here, yeah, I would use the tester's tube cement, or you that's the one I most likely use. Now, on our stock car, there came the plastic grab irons, and I want to remove those. I change everything to wire, just, uh, and uh, as you notice, I, I also put a note, well, so here we've carved them off, but you also notice that our number now uh, on this car has changed from 168 to 163. We also, to uh, do the to do the grab irons, if you're gonna do them yourself or you insert commercial ones, uh, they're the tools I use on the left. It's just a cutter, a uh, couple of uh, needle nose, the shop smith from uh, Hobby Lobby, and that is a smooth jaw which I like, and you have the serrated jaw. Those are my two that I players I use every day if I'm modeling or every time I'm at the bench, and that cutter, I've. I have a collection of others. The best one in there is that uh, on the uh, that's on the right side. You have that silver handled one. That's a what well, I call a square jaw. We used to call it. Now most of the uh, ads for the player call it a parallel jaw player. So that's another one that's nice to have in the toolbox. Obviously, if you're going to do your own wire uh, grab bending, you have to have a gauge. You can there are commercial ones out there. Uh, I buy, I've made my own here, as you see, out of a piece of styrene and I make a clearance gauge. Also, again, that caliper we talked about where you got, on, when you do the grab irons here, the caliper is being used. You took a measurement on the car from uh, one side of the grab iron where the molded on rivet may be to the other side, molded on rivet, take that measurement, put it on that, uh, grab iron gauge you see i've drilled many a hole in my day for grab irons on all the various type models over the years i've built and it's served very well however if you choose you want to buy a commercial one they are out there and you can do so also uh on this particular model there there were the holes were undersized uh from the manufacturer that drilled for the door chain rod and so Ra and rather this time, which you could use a drill to expand that hole, we're going to look at another tool I recommend you strongly have in your toolbox is the reamers. And all they are is uh, a tool that is it's four-sided cutting tool, except the little guys in the blue package and the hawk on the right. Those are really, again, from the orthodontist industry. The regular reamer in the yellow package is my go-to. And I can't give you a name as to who I, where I bought them or who. The back of the package says France. Most likely I bought them along the way from the tool man and he acquired them from uh, a company maybe in France, I don't know. But the small blue ones, those I've bought at various, uh, there, if you've ever had a, uh, have a root canal done at the orthodontist, these are the ones by Hawk over there are the type of instrument they use. The one large, ones are the same instrument except it's over on and for very very fine holes if you've drilled one and don't want to use uh, another drill to expand it you can put one of these in there and expand it to a much larger size much quicker than putzing with changing drills etc okay then of course the painting of, of various parts when we've added in this case it happens to work we put the grab irons on so they again needed painting and another tool you're gonna to have to have is your paint brushes, obviously. Uh, buy good quality ones. I, I recommend 
I think for the life, and if you keep them clean, take care of them, they will last you uh, for a very, very long time. And as you, on the right side, you notice I already mentioned the Armor All Glass Cleaner. Uh, that was, I still use for brush cleaning since I happen to have the old stuff that the formula is still good. So that's just another. Airbrushes, yeah, obviously for, is another great tool to have for models. If you got to paint them from, if the model, you're working with an undecorated model or you've stripped a model that you're decaling for a particular car that you want, then uh, you may airbrush is the way to go. Uh, I happen to like the pochets because my, for my hand, they just fit it the best. So, uh, and the bottom one down there on the left side is an H. And I started with that because uh, when I first, I had Badger, I had a Badger 250. When I went from solvent-based paint will to polyscale, I had absolute disasters, the gun clogging, et cetera. Picked up a book uh, along the way on air, you know, airbrushing and water base, and they recommended uh, the H by Pache, lar larger, the deal is the needles. You know, you can have uh, different size needles. There's a five, there's a three, there's five, there's a seven. Uh, in my Pache there, that's the talon in the middle, which I, is my number one brush I go to use all the time. It has a number seven needle in it, which is the largest needle, uh, what is recommended for uh, water-based paints. And once the Vallejo is thin properly, and that you see on the, on the right side there, there's the air, there's my uh, paint booth that I have. I've had that, uh, that was a gift from my spouse uh, from the year, believe it or not, 1983. Uh, I, uh, with several others, I was the chair for, if you're familiar with Train Fest, the, at the time it was called the Mariah Model Railroad Industry Association. They eventually, uh, they used to have a show like Train Fest, uh, and they were separate from the HIA Hobby Industry Association, and they would move around the country. And in 83, they had come, we, I got contacted. I would happen to be the division superintendent. They wanted to come to Minneapolis and we set up. So we, I worked on that show for about three years with others. But uh, the gentleman who was selling this particular model at the time, uh, it happened to be my birthday that day at the end of the show. He said to my spouse, your husband was over here uh, salvating over it and I can't use it or take it back with me. So would you like to have it for, uh, basically give it to her almost for free. And then you see the down below, I mix all paints by the eye drop, which is why I like the Vallejo. And I'm one of these, every time I, I paint, whether a model, my normal starting out is 30 drops of paint right now, uh, out of a Vallejo uh, model color and 20 drops of thinner. I mix my own thinner, which is a combination of uh, Vallejo Improver and their airbrush cleaner and distilled water. The distilled water being 50%, the other two in the uh, thinner bottle, 25%. Anyway, earlier I also mentioned I keep on the desk the drift cards. In the When we were in the polyscale, they had beautiful charts for us of the paints they had for their railroad colors. Vallejo does not give us that option. So they, uh, you will have to make your own drift card, so to speak. And I originally made them in paper. Now I do them in sterene. And also then here you have a mixer and you have your tapes for taping. Uh, and I see I, we have... I'm running late here, am I not? I'm sorry. Uh, well, then we have a paint holders that, uh, you know, you should have. I have one that I built for what it's worth and I use a lot. Uh, decal process, again, I just use various foams, holders for decals to hold the cars. You notice down on the bottom, uh, there's one, when I, you do a decal and end, you can build it up. Also, one thing here real quick, that tool in the upper up there, uh, those glasses you see, I have reached a point where a lot of these thin film decals are it's so hard to read. And those glasses came from uh, the company in Florida, Model Expo, and they have a 10X in them. And I can now use them and I can read 
the finest decal on a decal sheet of paper with them. So just something, this is something I just picked up about three months ago. Anyway, then for decal cutting, you got your various scissors. The surgeon scissors available are excellent, especially for Harold's, things like that. Your decals, making them yourself, you can dry transfers on the decal paper, cover them with Micromart liquid decal <laughs> film. And eventually then you get to whether you should weather or not. I use eyeshadow where you have your uh, powders, you have your uh, obvious pan pastels, which are here various applicators for for them from sponges to the micro applicators and we'll cut at this point i could go on with other tools that i did in this presentation but uh i see where i'm, I'm about 10 minutes over where we normally quit so we can end here and that was the car as you can see uh now i don't know should we should we quit here then is it best or yeah, we probably should. We should probably okay. quit for today. Maybe we'll that's do part funny. two or something. But that's that. That's excellent, no. Lester. Thank you. Oh, you're real, very welcome. Real okay. quick, uh, if anybody wants to see it, I've got a a homemade uh, drill that I use uh, that uses a Holland motor with a collet set that I got off of eBay um, that I use for drilling. Um, you know, like number 80 drill bit, drill holes for uh, wire grab irons. And it's just real simple. You just go, whoops, wrong way. You just go straight <laughs> up, straight down, and the hole's drilled. Excellent. No, no, no bending with using a pin vise. Uh, it's really quick. And I, I mark one terminal on the motor with red so that I know that that's, that's where I put the positive so that it turns the right way. <laughs> Very good. Well, and if you guys, if, the, if anybody has any questions, another day or uh, yeah. shoot me an email if, you're, if there's something I can help you with in the tool line. I'm mm -hmm. kind of a tool junkie and I've tested a lot of tools over the, in my area, in the region and our division, I'm known as the tool junkie and I test a lot of tools. And I've done a lot of write up of different articles. So if I can help you out, be glad to do so. That's great info, Lester, and a great presentation. Thank you very much. So, sorry for overrunning. Oh, that's this, all right. Oh, well <laughs> worth our while. Thank you. All right. This is the needle bottle that I mentioned in the uh, in the in the chat yep. as well. Awesome. Well, that's great. Uh, next week we are looking for a presenter. So if you're interested, let me know. And uh, we will see you then. In the meantime, if you celebrate Easter, have a great Easter. Same <laughs> to all of you. Same all to you. Right. May the bunny be good to each of you. If he That's does. right. That's right. <laughs> all right. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Thanks. Thanks. Good night.